This is the fifth lecture of the series. Tonight is called The Honeymoon is Over. And obviously the reason I'm going to say that is because I'll start by pointing out the 1948 to the 63, the first 15 years of Israel, 48 to 63, the first 15 years of Israel uh, were the free years of the honeymoon. And the reason I say it was no Palestinian cause. Israel had a free ride. All the stuff that comes later starts later. Israel had problems, obviously, in the first 15 years. It goes without saying. And they had state-to-state uh, -to -state issues with Egypt and Jordan and so forth. But that's, as we all know today, unfortunately, of a different character. Uh, we're now living in a world in which, little by little, the states are disintegrating. But the problems get worse. And so the absence of state actors is like a defining feature of our time. And you don't know what to do anymore. The years I'm talking about, the first 15 years, which coincide with the Ben-Gurion era. Isn't that interesting? The first 15 years, the Palestinian issue, as we call today, was in hibernation. Or I should pass a remission. Um, this is due, or this had been generated by a chain of poor choices made by the Palestinians during the mandate period. Uh, you say it's a minish uh, First of all, the leadership of the Palestinian Arabs fell to the wrong guy, to the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the head of the Hussein, he's not the Nasha Shibis, not the ones who were moderate and would have negotiated a better deal for the Arabs long, long ago, like in the 30s or something, um, because the Jews were willing to make such a deal. But instead, they got the most extreme type of individual, as we all know. Um, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem from day one, when he took over in the 20s, that's not true, day two, because day one he was appointed by a Jew, Herbert Samuel, but from day two, uh, kill the Jews. And uh, you look at this, I, Howard found it from a couple years ago, the Peel Commission in 1936, when the first intifada started, in the time of the British Mandate, and uh, there were riots and a uh, re revolt. So the British government, perhaps you recall, perhaps you don't, sent an official, high-class, high-level investigation commission by Lord Peel, headed by Lord Peel, to see what's doing and recommend a solution. And they heard testimony from the Jewish side and from the Arab side. Thank you. And uh, the Mufti was on the, was, was, at that time was giving the Arab side. And you see in a second that Lord Peel, in a very British type way, says, well, what do you propose to do with the Jews? They said, well, well, we'll get rid of them. Don't worry, leave, leave that to us. Um, here, take a look at this. Thousands of years. Weizmann pointed out that the Arab nation already had five independent states, whereas the Jews, for whom an awesome catastrophe was foreseen, had no state anywhere. The Mufti, Hajamin al Husseini, claimed Palestine for the Arabs. They were its natural inhabitants for many generations, he said, and had the right of self determination. The Mufti said that Palestine was an Arab country, and the Jews were no more than strangers and invaders. At this point, commission members sought to ascertain what the fate of the Jewish minority would be if an Arab state were indeed set up in all Palestine, as the Mufti demanded. Sir Horace Rumbold, does your excellency believe that this country can assimilate and absorb the 400,000 Jews who currently reside here? The Mufti, no. Lord Peel, chairman. Then will it be necessary to banish some of them? comfortably or otherwise, according to circumstance? The Mufti. We'll have to leave that for the future. I think the, the Mufti said something to the effect, well, we'll time will deal with that problem. He seemed to imply um, liquidation of the, of the Jewish problem in an unpleasant way. It, it shocked the... So in other words, in 36, before the Second World War, the person who emerged as the leader of the Palestine Arab nationalist movement of extremists, you understand? This is not calculated to win the support of the Western nations. That's the point I'm trying to get across. And furthermore, this uh, party of his, in other words, his group, uh, they lead the Intifada against the British, revolt against the British in, in the 30s. It fails. In other words, in 1939, the British, by military force, crushed it. And the, as a result... The Mufti, who was the leader of this revolt, uh, became an outlaw persona non grata with the British, which was not smart, because what it meant was, as far as the Jews versus the Palestinian debate, 
in World War II, the only international voice that was heard was the Jewish one. You understand? The fact that the Mufti was in Berlin means that London is left to Weizmann, as it were. There weren't two delegations as uh, 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 Zionist and Palestinian petitioning the British government in 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. It's only Weizmann. It's, 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 uh, hello, Doverhu. This was simply not smart. Now, obviously, it's due to the fact that the Mufti bet that Hitler would win the war. I get that. But since he made a mistake, so the Palestinian Arab nationalist movement was set back profoundly by what I say was another poor choice. Um, indeed, I'm talking about the years 40 to 45 now, aren't I? And even later. It is the total control of the narrative in the United States of America which is the most powerful weapon of the Zionists in the struggle politically to create Israel. If you're in the U.S. in 42, 43, 44, 45, what, you know, all you hear is this guy, correct? Abel Hosever goes from, is, is, is well known and, he, and is appearing in, in uh, newsreels and in magazines, uh, Time Magazine, Reader's Digest, Look, New York Times, Herald Tribune, all that sort of thing. And so if you're an average American, I say again, the average American out there reading the paper, the Hearst papers, the other papers, you're getting the Jewish thing. They never even heard of them. I mean, they know they're Arabs in Palestine. They know the Arabs don't like the Jews. But you know, there's no spokesman. There's nobody. There's no face that you can do it. And only a tiny group of high-class wasps, okay, like the president of Barnard, uh, Virginia Gildersley, famous name in the past, uh, always appointed by the president to high level commissions, early feminist. You know, she's a, she had one of the seven sisters. Anybody know what the seven sisters are? <laughs> right. So she, you know, the fancy schmancy. She is uh, against the Zionist cause. Uh, people like her, Kermit Roosevelt. In other words, a tiny, very high class, very well connected group out there. But that can't fight effectively the Zionist propaganda mass onslaught in the media in the, during, during the war years, which cannot help, by the way, but be magnified by the Holocaust. The more it comes out, the more it makes sense. If the Jews had a state, you're going to kill six million Jews. Hard to deny that, you see. And um, especially when the war is over and you see all the pictures from Dachau and all that stuff, uh, what Palestine, there is no other narrative. Again, People know, they're not stupid, that they're the Arabs that don't like the Jews. But that's how they know it, the way I'm saying to you. There's no face, there's no argument in there. And the total control of the narrative is really, I'll say it again, uh, the secret weapon the Jews have in their political, successful political struggle under Truman to get a Jewish state. Uh, she is frustrated, and she says that she blamed her failure to prevent the creation of the state of Israel on the Zionist control of the media communication, which was true. Now, I don't mean that there's a mass conspiracy in a, in, in a room in Manhattan which they telling all the newspapers what to do. Nor did she. You know, she's obviously a sophisticated individual. Come on, President Barnard. But uh, you want to say she says only one, one, one narrative is getting out there. Only American people only hear one side of the story. And she set up these organizations with these other guys, but didn't get much traction. You understand? If you're a member of the State Department or an Arabist, or obviously with the oil companies, or a missionary, there are certain types of people out there that are interested in this issue. If I asked everybody here, can anybody really know the details of the argument between China and the Philippines over these islands? Or, yeah, maybe one or two, but you know, the average person has no idea what we're talking about. They know in general, uh, or maybe they don't. But uh, it was the same thing at that time. And so what I'm trying to say is over here, as far as tactics is concerned, the Palestinian Arabs made uh, terrible choices in the crucial years, okay? After the war, when the war was over, Second World War, the Arabs insist that their national leader is the Mufti. Uh, not a great choice. You, know, you understand? I mean, <laughs> here's a guy to ally with Hitler. And the Arabs said, well, we don't care. He's really the one that does so. I get it. I understand why they feel that way. But from a PR point of view, it really silences their voice, and it allows uh, Weizmann, Ben-Gurion, people like this, Abba Hill Silver, to go make the case and get nothing you know, uh, persuasive on the other side. Um, the Arabs go on to uh, reject the partition of 1947. Right? It's not like they accepted it and said, let's, let's try to modify it in our favor or something like that. They said, we're not governed the whole thing at all, which again was a poor choice.
Because suppose they would have said, we take it, we're not happy with it, but we take it over here. Israel could never take a piece of land from them. We would have Jaffa next door to Tel Aviv with 90,000 Arabs in 1948. Oh my God. <laughs> you understand? You'd have the, the road to Jerusalem completely consisting of Arab villages. Oh my God. You'd have a tiny piece of the Negev, as you can see on this map, as opposed to the other. But they're so angry, and they were not as smart as Ben-Gurion, as smart as the Jews. They said, let's take a half a loaf, and then, and then we'll figure out what to do. So again, you have a chain of poor choices. And uh, the Mufti, in 1947-48, declared publicly that the goal of the struggle against the Jews is to wipe out the Jews. He said, that we're going to kill them all drive him in the sea, and he'll take over the whole country, and so on and so on. I mean, again, not, even if you plan to do it, you don't go and broadcast, but he couldn't help being of who he was. Um, and here's the biggest mistake. The Palestinian Arab society itself was nowhere prepared uh, for a war. He said so rhetorically, and the fire eaters who were in his, you know, you know the type. There are certain people, they, yes, let's go kill them. But objectively speaking, they had no Ben-Gurion who said, what are our pluses? What are our minuses? What are our resources? What are our chances? What's our strategy? All that. They didn't do any of that. They said, let's kill the Jews, arm everybody, and drive them out. You know, it's not a speech over here. You're talking about a, a, a struggle, a war. And so the, the Palestinian Arab society, which most people don't know much about in the old days, was still physically wounded by the very tough British suppression of the revolt in 1939. People don't understand. In 36, 37, 38, they uh, launched what they called the Intifada, like now, and they took over whole areas, and they shot up, uh, uh, you know, cars going through, and they uh, wouldn't let the British in, all the rest of it. And the British played a softball in 36, 37, 38. They thought that, you know, one way they could, they, they could negotiate some way out of this. But by the end of 38, uh, late 38, Cham- Neville Chamberlain, of all people, saw this is not working. And on the contrary, no British soldier can walk in the entire old city. No British soldier can walk in the Arab areas of many towns. He said, we're not going to let this happen. And so he said 50,000 British soldiers in late 38, early 39. And they physically conquered uh, house to house the whole thing, the whole country. And they shot and killed and hanged and starved and all that kind of business. There was no CNN at that time. Uh, and then they said, listen, we don't want to play the hardball, but you give it no choice. And they did physically. So, so lots of people were killed. Uh, lots of villages were destroyed. They used to take people out in the middle of the night, stuff their mouth with uh, dust, and they, you know, leave them there. You know, people, people have no idea. But again, the British are like this. We're only doing this because you leave us no choice. So what it means is that by the time the revolt was suppressed, which is in the middle of 39, just before the beginning of the Second World War, physically speaking, the Arab villages were busted. Um, yeah, yeah, the, the, the leaders of the revolt were either killed or in jail or they'd run away to other countries like the Mufti himself. Um, and a lot of the clans who make up the Palestinian society um, were not pro-Mufti necessarily. And they said, like, look at all the sorrows you caused us. And so they hated him and he hated them. And so it was a very divided society. And uh, people don't know this. Uh, partisans of the Mufti bumped off rival leaders of anti-Mufti Arab clans, Palestinian, in places like Beirut and Damascus and Baghdad during the 41, 42, 43, 44, during the war, notice these Palestinian interest struggles, which were murderous, continued in the middle of the Second World War, so they had the opposite of unity. Now I might point out that the Jews had the same problem in the Second World War with, the, with Begin and Ben-Gurion and all that, but nevertheless, this is what was happening. Um, the Palestinian society, therefore, was fractionated by the violent methods of the Grand Mufti's uh, guys and the opposition is engendered. There were uh, many uh, villages and uh, communities that said, we hate the Mufti, everything, t- everything he touches. The Palestinians, under the leadership of the Mufti, uh, failed to train a Haganah. They failed to set up a Jewish agency, you know, their parallel version of it. They failed to set up a secondary school system and make high schools. Uh, they relied on a tiny, tiny elite that could read or write, and a very broad mass of uneducated followers. Not a smart move if you're planning a national struggle. They had no military plan to conquer Palestine. They didn't have an actual general staff and all that sort of thing. They just attacked a lot of convoys in Kibbutzim. And that ain't a way to go. You understand? We know, I talked about it in the past, they shot up all these, uh, you know, going from one city to another. They caused the Jews a lot of trouble, killed a lot of people. 
But in terms of a military doctrine, you know, a plan to actually physically take over the country, they didn't have one. Now, um, if you follow what I just said, although he didn't plan to do so, the Palestinian leadership that I'm describing played into the hands of the Jews, who actually did have an army. <laughs> That's the great achievement. Jews said, it was like they, they, they really had a general staff run by Yadin. They had an actual army commander's that trained, you know, Israel made a lot of mistakes in the beginning, the Palmach, we talked about that, but they, they got it right eventually, and they really had a general staff. And Ben-Gurion, people say he's a dictator, he said, I guess one guy has to be in charge of everything. That's how it goes. Otherwise, it's, 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 it's a Chinese fire drill. You know, you can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't have that. Right? It has to be somebody in charge. And he forced his way. He was tough, as we know. This is exactly the reason Ben-Gurion blew up the Al-Galina. Right? This is the reason for that famous thing that they're bitter about now. He said it can't have two armies and two ships and two, you know, the, and it can't be me and Begin. It's got to be me, 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 me. And say what you want. They did need a single leadership. This is precisely what gave the Jews their advantage in the 1948 war over the Palestinians. I'm not talking about the Arabs here. I'm talking about the Palestinians. Okay? And as a result, from November of 47 to April of 48, if you possibly recall, we talked about in the past, the Yishuv fought the Palestinians with one hand behind their back, maybe two hands behind their back. Okay? And that's why you had, like, they, they killed the Hadassah hospital convoy, because the Jews didn't really fight back with what they could. But once the Yishuv, in April of 48, months before Israel became a state, decided to flex the muscles, the Palestinians collapsed. Okay? So in April... So I can even tell you the dates. It was starting from the beginning of April to the middle of May. That's when the Palestinian thing broke down. And the Jews conquered uh, Haifa, Yafo, the roads, um, Akko, I mean, not Akko, but you know, a whole bunch of places like that. He got along, he conquered the whole Galilee in April and early May of 48. And drove, this, this is exactly the period when they actually drove the refugees out. You understand? Now, this is the area, this is the time period in which it was possible to do so, alone is particularly. And so, for example, when they had a bitter fight in Tzfat, they fought the Arabs, and the Arabs ran away, and then they all ran away, and then they wouldn't let them back in, and they chased these people outside to Jordan and all these other places. This is when it happened. So what does that reflect? The Jews were braver than the Arabs? It's not really true. But Jews were organized, and the Arabs were not organized. They were disorganized. Um, indeed, the main reason for the Arab invasion of Israel in May of 1948 was to rescue the hapless Palestinians. That's what they said, and it was true. Because in May 14th of 48, everybody could see, if you leave it alone, the Jews will literally take over the whole country because the Palestinians are so stupid that the whole thing is just collapsing everywhere. There was no way that they could prevent, uh, you know, the Jews from taking the old city of Jerusalem, for example, the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip and all the rest. I mean, they, 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 the Palestinians simply couldn't do it. And so the Egyptians and the Jordanians and the Syrians and the Lebanese said, we got to go in and help them. They had all their own reasons also. It wasn't all Lishma. It was also partly Shiloshma. But a lot of it was Lishma. You know, it, 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 it really was. And so what I'm trying to show you is that the whole Palestinian issue broke up in a weird way um, in the 48, 47, 48 war. And then, of course, there is the factor of King Abdullah. Okay? Um, now, he and the Mufti hate each other. They represent two different clans and two different groups for, for, for leadership, going back a long way. And um, King Abdullah was back from Lawrence and Arabia times. That's right. He and, he and his brother were Faisal. That's what was, was Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, he wasn't in the movie. Now, <laughs> Faisal was in the movie. But the brother was also there. And the British had promised, they thought, a huge Arab state consisting of the whole Arab Middle East. Uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Israel. Imagine that, you know, one big state. That's what, that, that's what they promised them. Plus Saudi Arabia, by the way. Now, uh, he ended up only, as you know, with Jordan, with the country we call Jordan today. Um, that was his consolation prize. But he never made peace with that. He was just a very smart guy in his way. And he said, little by little, I'll get the rest back. And so where I'm going with this is that he already had plans in the 20s and 30s that he will be the king of the Palestinians. And, excuse me, it was very pragmatic. So when the United Nations offered a partition in 1947, the partition of Palestine, King Abdullah, who was a smart fellow, said like this, take it, and now it's part of Jordan. Right? On the contrary, 
with my army and my help, we will be able to resist the Jews, the acquisitiveness of the Jews. Now, he didn't ask the Palestinians if they want to be ruled by him. He took them for Dover Pasha, because this is the Arab world. Now, um, the point is like this. You therefore had within the Palestine Arab sector two key groups that want to take over. The Grand Mufti guys on the one hand, and the King Abdullah guys on the other hand. The upshot of the 48 war was the fall of the Mufti and the victory of Abdullah. No question about it. The Mufti and this whole thing were completely destroyed or kicked aside. And by the time you end up with this, this is the part that remained for the Palestinians, as you know, the West Bank, as they call it. And it was all taken over by Abdullah. As a matter of fact, his army held it against the Jews. That's why Israel didn't take over the old city, and that's why Israel did not take over the West Bank. Better or worse, whatever the reason is, uh, you know, and he even cut a deal with them. And he even gave Israel a tiny little chalik up here where uh, some of the Arab villages, the big Arab villages now are, Omar Fakhim and the others, uh, in order that Israel should agree that he should keep the West Bank and the old city. This is a clear deal that Ben-Gurion made. One of the reasons Ben-Gurion made the deal, not the only reason, but one of the very important facts of the reason is to stifle the Palestinian issue. You get it? By doing this, there's no Palestinian question. And the reason I say that is because they're part of Jordan. Now, um, since his army had saved the Palestinians, as Abdullah thought, and he was true, because otherwise they'd be taken over by Israel, Abdullah was crowned king of the West Bank in late 48. It's what they call the Jericho Conference. Okay, there, there's Abdullah. Now, he arranged the whole thing, obviously. But nevertheless, it doesn't matter. Uh, he said like this. He says, all the important and notables, all the Hushua people from the West Bank have now agreed that I should be the king of the West Bank. And uh, now the other Arab countries didn't agree with this. And they thought this is a dirty pool. And they hated Abdullah. And he actually... His, his, I mean, he was an interesting guy. His long-term plan was to take over the whole business. One day he's going to conquer Syria. One day he's going to conquer Iraq. He was nuts. But nevertheless, uh, and one day hopefully he'll take over Israel in, in, in some way. This was, this was his big plan. Now, of course, none of this was real, but I'm just telling you the way things worked out in 48 and 49. And the idea was, therefore, that what you and I call the West Bank, it's not Palestine, it's part of Jordan. Uh, the Grand Mufti, of course, was enraged that his whole cause collapsed. There's no real Palestinian state. It's taken over by his enemy, an interloper, or an Arab from somewhere else who's, who's not Palestinian, as he saw it. And the Grand Mufti uh, was backed by the other Arab states. They didn't like this either. Jordan, um, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Egypt, those kind of countries. Saudi Arabia, they said, who made uh, King Abdullah the head of the Palestinians, you know? And you're stifling their cause, which was true. And Egypt if you remember, was the exception. They took over the Gaza Strip. And Israel was not successful, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, unfortunately. And kicking them out in 4049. Truman stopped that. We talked about that before. But, um, but nevertheless, this was not under Abdullah. As you can see, the West Bank was under Abdullah. This, Egypt held, they said, this should be just for the Palestinians. And the Grand Mufti set up a Republic of Palestine in the late 48. You understand? And this should be the real uh, Palestine, and it was recognized by all the Arab states. But again, the Palestinians are stupid. There's no way in 1948 that Harry S. Truman recognized the Grand Mufti as the head of some republic. That was Hitler, you understand? I mean, this was just dumb. They thought that the world would get any... They got zero traction outside the Arab world over there because to them, the Mufti equals Hitler, which wasn't so far from the truth. And consequently, why should, that's the Republic of Palestine. So it didn't go anywhere, so it collapsed, meaning it, it didn't have any reality to it. So the real winner was King Abdullah, and he proceeded to suppress Palestinian identity in favor of a Jordanian identity, and he particularly suppresses anything connected with the Grand Mufti. Why not? He wants a country called Jordan, and he wants all the people in the West Bank to be part of Jordan. If he starts looking at them as a separate people, guess what? There are more Arabs living in the West Bank than in Jordan. You know what I'm saying? The country of Jordan itself actually had a rather small Bedouin-type population. The new people he took over outnumbered them. Oy vey. <laughs> if they have a vote, they'll vote him out and put the Grand Mufti in or something like that. And so he had to arrange things in such a way through sneaky, leaky maneuvers. And, uh, you know, the Arabs know how to do this. They put the right people in the right place and get rid of the wrong people in the wrong place. And the bottom line is, uh, there are no Palestinians here. It's all Jordanians. You follow? 
It's all Jordanians. Of course, they, he knows they're Palestinians, and they had the refugee camps there from the people who ran away from Israel. And, you know, Jordan obviously played on that. But the point, but they were full citizens of Jordan. He gave, no other country did this, by the way. The Syrians did not give the refugees Syrian citizenship. I'm talking about the Syrian refugees today. The Lebanese didn't do that. The, um, the Egyptians didn't do that. But the Jordanians did do that. And he considered, he said, now I have a country not of seven or 800,000 people. They have a country of the two million people, you see. So my point uh, out of all this is that this policy of Jordan becomes a key feature of Jordanian rule of the West Bank, and it's actually great for Israel. He didn't do it to help Israel, but that's why uh, historians now write about collusion across the Jordan, King Abdullah and the Zionist movement, partition of Palestine, Be- and by, by, naturally by a left-wing Jew, you know. And, uh, obviously, and his whole point is like this, they colluded together to suppress the Palestinian narrative. That's not actually true, but I understand why he says it. The net effect of it was true. You understand? The net effect is that if you come to 1949, 1950, I know the map is already neat again. There's Israel, that's the Jewish part. There's the West Bank and Jordan, that's the Arab part. You know, there's Gaza, that belongs to the Egyptian part. And fine, life goes on. You see? And so uh, if you're a Palestinian Arab nationalist or you want a, your own Republic of Palestine or something like that, you get no voice whatsoever. Um, the UN as part of the deals where they made the armistice that settled the fighting in 1949 to the degree they did, they wrote in there that the armistice is just the first step. It has to be followed by a peace conference in Lausanne, Switzerland. And so Israel and all the Arabs sent delegates to Switzerland, to Lausanne, in 1949. And the idea was they should talk to each other and come with a final peace treaty. Well, we know that didn't go anywhere. Uh, they wouldn't even talk to the Israelis. But informally they did. Israel sent its Number one diplomat at that time, Elio Sasson, who's a Syrian Jew, so he speaks Arabic. He's from Damascus, and uh, and a Sephardi Jew, you know. And uh, here's my point: uh, Elio Sasson conducted informal conversations with the Egyptians, the Syrians, the Jordanians, the Lebanese. Who's left? The Iraqis. I don't know. You know, everybody who's there. The Palestinian Arabs, which really means the, the Mufti types, they send somebody there. I'm not talking to you. Who are you? You're not a state actor, and uh, the mo- and you don't like us, and uh, you know, so we don't even talk to you. And the other Arabs agreed with that. They didn't insist on this either. And so the whole Lausanne conference, which didn't really go anywhere, was a testimony to the fact that the Palestinian voice was uh, suppressed, was, was not heard. And so the situation I'm talking about is so great for Israel that the Palestinians were convinced that Abdullah was on their payroll because... You know, how did their lawyer say it? Kui bono, right? You know, who benefits from all this? And so they killed him. Right? They killed, that's why they killed Abdullah. In Amman, capital of the Jordan, there is mourning in the palace and great sorrow in the hearts of the people. The king who made them a nation is no more. In the great Arab revolt, King Abdullah fought alongside Lawrence. He learned to love Britain. And in these days of trial, he was our friend. For this, he died. To the old city of Jerusalem, King Abdallah went for the Friday prayers. Among his own people, he walked unguarded and unafraid. But there were those who hated him. And as the king entered the mosque to pray, a young fanatic killed the one man who might have brought peace to the Middle East. That's a British propaganda piece, as you see. But it doesn't matter. The guy who shot him makes sense. He said he's the one that messed us over. He's working for Ben-Gurion, obviously. Because things have worked out in such a way that the Palestinian Arab cause doesn't exist anymore. You understand? So, so Abdullah's in there. But his assassination does not change the Jordanian reality, which elides a Palestinian national identity. There are no Palestinians. They're just Israelis and Jordanians. And that's what Ben-Gurion, the Israelis, and everybody said for the next decade. You understand? There's no Palestinians. There's, there's refugees. But there's, there's only state actors. There are countries over there. And the Palestine issue has been settled. In other words, the United Nations said there should be two states. There are two states. We have disagreements over the borders. Right? We have disagreements over what should be done with the refugees. But there are two states. The two states, one is called Israel, the other one is called Jordan. That was the Israeli position. And that was the position held by much of the world, even though in point of actual fact, if you want to get down to it, only England and Pakistan legally recognize the Jordanian um, annexation of the West Bank. But it doesn't matter. That's how the world uh, thought of it. The, uh, I hope I haven't confused you. That's the confusion that's coming. 
Now, the Palestinians in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, are under Egyptian occupation and administration. That's a different story, as I said. Uh, we have the map there. But, um, and they're there for their own good. They couldn't, I mean, if it was just the Palestinians in uh, Gaza, Israel could take them over in a minute. So the Egyptian army was there. But their status is in limbo, and they don't form a Palestinian republic. It's not what happens. That is not something that Egypt fosters or even imagines. And the reason is because in the early years, Egypt is wrapped up in its own problems. They were getting rid of Farouk, Nasser's coming in, and then they want to nationalize Egypt, kick the British out of Egypt, nationalize the Suez. So a, Egypt has a full plate of their own Egyptian issues to deal with, which they do deal with, and not worry about what's going on with the Palestinians in Gaza. To be sure, Egypt and the other Arab states raise the quote-unquote Palestine question all the time. They do that. And theoretically, they're committed to setting up some kind of Palestinian state or republic, preferably on the ruins of the Jewish state, possibly uh, in conjunction with one. Every president of the United States, since Truman to Obama, has been committed to a two-state solution. You understand that well, right? Now, if the Palestinians would be satisfied with Jordan, it good. But the fact is, they never. No president has said Israel can keep the whole thing. You know, like, like uh, Begin wanted. You know, nobody says Eretz Yisrael Shlima. I'll say it again. It's never been part of the American uh, policy. Um, the only thing is, where and when will the Palestinian state uh, be with? But as long as it's a theoretical level, as I told you last time, Israel keep kicking that ball down the road. Uh, in reality, the, the Arab states are preoccupied in the early years in winning their own independence. Okay, look at this map. Uh, Egypt really got independent uh, technically in 22, but really in, 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 in 53. Uh, Libya in 51, Algeria in 62, Morocco 56. Uh, these countries, till they really got rid of the other stuff here, 56. What I'm trying to show you is in the early years of Israel, they had their own independent stuff to worry about. You follow? They want to kick the British out, they want to kick the French out, all that stuff. And so lip service, everybody pays. Yeah, Israel's terrible. The Arabs should get their state. But meanwhile, we want to get the French out of Algeria or out of Tunisia or something like that. All of this was good for Israel. <laughs> you follow my point? All of this meant that um, nobody's paying attention to the Palestine business. That doesn't mean Israel had a free ride during the 50s, because we know that Ben-Gurnier was a, t- a time of great hostility, but it was not of the hostility of the type that I'm speaking about, right? It was of a different nature. Um, indeed, Arab nationalism, that movement that I've described, helped Israel by creating an environment of deferring Palestine until a great Arab independent state system was created which will never happen. Today, it's more disintegrated than ever. You know, the Middle East is a bunch of states that are had it, uh, you know, have failed, are failing, or will attain failure you know, in, the, in the near future. But this, this, this is the name of the game. Uh, in this sense, Nasser, believe it or not, helped Israel because he was the apotheosis of nationalism and of deferment. Uh, what I'm trying to say is like this. Nasser, during the 50s, the early 60s, everybody put all their faith in the Arab world in Nasser. And so Nasser said, first we've got to do this, then we've got to do this, then we've got to do that. We'll get to Palestine too, don't worry about it, we will. But meanwhile, we've got to do this, that, and the other thing, and the other thing, and the other thing. And that put, they put all their koiches into Nasserism, which therefore meant, de facto, that they were deferring the raising of the Palestinian Arab issue in any kind of a real way. That's why I always consider it funny... Uh, if you're interested in the juxtaposition of pictures, I, I told you before, no, but I'm, uh, uh, in the uh, late 50s, I think it was, when France and Israel were kissing cousins, and the French general Koenig came to Israel, uh, when France and Israel were very close, and, uh, he, he, and he met Menachem Begin, I think it was, and he, he, the, the point was like this, do you have, uh, the, in France, the Catholic country is a Jewish country, in France they have a lot of saints, does Israel have any saints? They said, we have one saint, Ari Levin. So he said, I want to meet him. So, he said, so then he said to the guy, he said, well, you're the real thing. General Kinnick, the Frenchman. And he said, I see you're the real thing. Why don't you just curse Nasser? <laughs> give him a claw. That'll finish him off. And he said like this, he said, I don't give curse, I only give blessing, only brachas. I'm not giving him a bracha, but I'm not going to give him claws. So I want to tell you something. When I first read that story many years ago, I thought, it's a nice from story, you know, I, I, I get it. You know, it's a uh, nicey nicey. That that's fine, but in the with the benefit of hindsight, you see over here. There's a certain 
what they call Das Torah, you know, certain, certain genius. Because the truth of the matter is, not that anybody could ever see it, Nasser was actually helping Israel. Not that he wanted to. He was deferring on and on the whole Palestine thing. And second of all, he was especially at this time, in the late 50s and early 60s, spending most of his time murdering by the thousands the Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> okay? Uh, something that nobody's doing today. So we have a different, at least I have a different perspective of Nasser. Once again, not saying that he was a nice guy, but the good Lord works in strange ways. What can I tell you? Now, um, the Palestinians during these years had no choice but to go along. They allowed themselves to be swept by Nasserist rhetoric. And one day in the future, there'll be their tag, you know. One day will come the day of revenge. But as far as ben is concerned, 20 years, 30 years, whatever you want, just, you know, not now. <laughs> down, down the road, down the road, way down the road. Uh, same is true, by the way, for the Israeli Arabs. They did not rebel, um, even if they wanted to, against the martial law under which they were subject in Ben-Gurion's time. Remember, we talked about that. They, you know, they were under martial law. Because the young people who were growing up in the Israeli Arab community, they satisfied with having secret pictures of Nasser. You understand? And listening to Nasser's speech on the radio. This is the way of getting back in Israel. If that's the way of getting back in Israel, I can live with it. You know, it's better than stabbing somebody. You understand? So they, so they poured all their energy into this uh, phantom, I, I suppose you call it. Um, so who is the big beneficiary of everything I'm talking about? Israel. Right. Not that anybody could see this, but we could see it with hindsight. Now, um, instead of actors, the Palestinians were objects. Instead of members of their own country, they're refugees. The solutions that were offered during these years were solutions for refugees and not for nationalists. We talk about JFK and Rusk and the Johnston Plan and the resettling of refugees and how many will Israel take back. All that language is language not of setting up a country or a republic, but of just you know, like the Syrian refugees say, what do you do with the human debris of the debacle? Where are you going to stuff them? Uh, but if any country at that time would say, we'll take them all in, and Kennedy would say, great, let's send them all there. There was no question about sending up, it never entered Kennedy's mind or anybody like that, make a Palestinian state. Uh, Jordan's already there. You understand? And so this is the way even those who are sympathetic to the Arab cause were thinking in those years. Most importantly, the broad Western public doesn't even know the Palestinians exist. Now I'm going to play for you something in a minute from the BBC. Did it once before, where they interviewed Nasser and Ben Gurion in '56 before the Sinai campaign. When you hear Nasser talk about the problem of the Palestinians, you know what he means because you're living in 2015. And whether we like it or not, we become aware and sensitized to this whole business. I can guarantee you. And if you're honest, ask yourselves, if you went back to 56, if you're old enough, or your parents' time, the American uh, or British uh, TV viewer, he doesn't know what the guy's talking about. You understand? He doesn't know what he's talking about. L listen to this. What is the Arab case against Israel? Really, the Arab case is the case of Palestinians, the case of human rights, the case of those who, people who were driven out of their land, of their motherland, to be refugees in the other Arab countries. This is really what we feel is the most important uh, problem. We have two problems. The problem of the refugees, the one million refugees, and the problem of the frontiers. What contribution is Israel prepared to make towards the Arab refugee problem? Well, we would help them financially. We would compensate them for their property and we would put our experts and our experience in settling refugees as we have settled since the establishment of the state more than 700,000 refugees uh, most of them from Arab countries we will put our, all our experience at the disposal of the Arab countries to settling Arab refugees in their countries But on what sort of conditions do you think it would be possible to have a peace settlement? Uh, really, it is not a matter of conditions. I mean, ben Gurion just bamboozled him. I'm, I'm using polite language. The, um, you, you understand what I'm saying? And, and the reason is like this. I can tell you right now, the I mean, average guy, the Palestinian refugees, I, don't know, I know the refugees. What, 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 look, what's he, you know, what's he, what exactly is he talking about? You see? That was the glass wall the Arab spokesman ran into in Western consciousness in the good old 50s in the early 60s when these issues came up because 
as I said, before, the Arabs have a country. I mean, you know, the the, the, the Arabs control East Jerusalem, right? I mean, they have Hebron, they have the West Bank. I mean, you know, what, what they want. Sounds like all he wants to do is destroy Israel. Well, that we're not willing to back him on. You see, and so um, all this worked during the 1950s, and by the 60s, the Nasserist rhetoric is starting to wear thin. Moreover, after Algeria kicked the French out in 62, the question for the Arabs is, what's next? Because after the French had kicked out, almost every country, with uh, small exceptions, had gotten rid of the colonialists, and they got their independence. So what talk is next for the Arab nationalism? Um, Now, remember, uh, intelligent uh, statesmen in the early 60s saw, like Kennedy, that unless some real settlement of the refugee problem was reached, it would blow up. So smart guys in the State Department and places like that, they weren't all just dummies. They saw that some, you know, it's festering, it's going somewhere, it's not going to be good. Um, where's it going to go? And that's why Kennedy, for example, wanted to say, let's really, you know, tell me Israel, you take 100,000, a half a million, whatever, and let's put this to bed, you know? There shouldn't be a refugee problem anymore. But on the other hand, the Arab insistence on the full right of return made it a non-starter for Ben-Gurion and Golden Mayor. I mean, if you bring in a million Arabs, what they want or more, that's going to swamp Israel. And finally, um, by the early 1960s, relations between Nasser and King Hussein were toxic. Um, Hussein's throne, he's the successor of Abdullah, depended on the non-revival of Palestinian nationalism, correct? His throne depended on the non-revival of Palestinian nationalism and this Jordanian thing, that they should all say that they're Jordanians. So therefore, since Nasser hated him, that's exactly the button that he wants to push. Okay? Now, Ad Khan and Chitzonius, everything I talked about now has to do, had to do with the external realities that govern the situation in the period I'm talking about. And Mikam El now I'm going to talk about what's going on internally with the Arabs, with the Palestinians. After the 48 war, the Palestinians themselves were overwhelmed by the disaster of 48, it was the failure of an entire society, certainly the radical failure of their elites. There's a famous book now, which I recommend by Ephraim Karsh. He's a real historian. He's not one of these pro-Arab things. And he's in England. And as Palestine betrayed, it's betrayed by their own people. That's what it, the, the thesis of the book. You understand? Um, and he has all the facts and figures. So all the things I just mentioned to you about how they made one bad choice after another and they made claims and they didn't have any plans for a war and all that, and they, they did stupid things, one, one stupid thing after another stupid thing. It's all outlined in his book. I, I knew it anyway, but he, he puts it together very nicely. Um, and, and the people knew it at that time, and they said, you know, I'm a Hayalano, how stupid we were. Um, it, whole segments of the Palestinian society did not partic- participate in the war. In the 48 war, I would guess half of the Palestinian population didn't even want the war and didn't participate in it. They just said, well, don't count us in. And that's the thesis of uh, this book, Army of Shadows by Professor Hillel Cohn, who is a left-winger and pro-Palestinian, but he tells it like it is. And um, uh, consequently, um, that whole generation felt like such failures, they just gave up and they had use. You know, they, did, they, they, they were uh, just wasting away, all of which was good for Israel. Hence the hiatus that I talk about of the 15 years of 48 to 63. However, in the course of time, you know, the, the, meanwhile, a new generation grew up of younger people that weren't part of what I just described, and, uh, or they didn't feel themselves responsible for it. This younger group grew up in the 1950s. They went to college. The ones I'm talking about went, went, went to university. Arafat, by the way, was a university graduate. I don't know if you know, they had an engineering degree. Their education made them politically aware. That's the wrong thing. They spend the 50s holding bull sessions in the dormitory rooms among themselves, which is exactly how movements start. You know, one feeds off the other, you get ideas together, you knock them around, all the rest of it. By the early 1960s, they're impatient. Nasser is not delivering the goods. And then the Middle East starts to heat up anyway. Okay? And here we have the problem of Israel and Syria, which I've gone back and forth a number of times I've alluded to. It's very complicated. I'll try to simplify it as much as you can. In 48, the, the, the borders that were driven up by, written up by the British and the French long ago, before Israel became a state, written in such a way that the whole Kinneret is outside of Syria. Okay? Now, in a crazy way, here's the Kinneret. This, right where I'm, where I'm pointing now with my porter, is 10 meters. How many feet is that? 
see, see what I'm saying? In other words, it's, it's a, so at the farthest side of the Canary, on the Arab side, for 30 feet it's Israel, and then it starts them. So the whole point of the drawing that border is to deny to Syria any access legally to the Sea of Galilee, to the Canaries. Okay? And this is because the French and the British had their reasons. There was a certain fairness in this, but this, this is how it worked out. Now, uh, Syria, when it became a country, they said, yes, who denies us in such a crazy way access to what's naturally a Syrian lake, at least as much as Palestine? And this is something that we don't agree with. We, 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 don't, we, we, don't, we don't concede. Um, Israel insisted on it uh, because this was like this. If we give them access, they'll demand half and more than half, and then we'll have even more trouble. Plus, they want to kill us. The Syrians are cruel. They want to kill us. Why should we give them anything? And, uh, I mean, if there's a peace treaty, we can talk about it. But the Syrians weren't ever interested in recognizing us to make a peace treaty. So they just said like this, we want to kill you, we don't recognize you, and give us access to the Canaries. The, 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 the welcome to the Middle East negotiating style. Uh, this map it shows you a little bit about after 67, but ignore this, because this all this was in Syria, the Golan Heights, obviously, before 67. That's the period we're talking about. So look at the nutty Israeli border. It runs from here all the way sort of down. It hugs the coast of the Kinneret, which is the main body of water, as we all know. And it denies Syria any access to it whatsoever. Um, there are whole areas over here, which are called DMZ, demilitarized zones. And that's because it's a little known uh, or a little remembered fact that um, in 48, Israel defeated the Egyptian army. Israel substantially defeated the Jordanian army. Israel defeated the Lebanese army. Israel did not defeat the Syrian army. People don't know that. The Syrians invaded Palestine. They took over a certain portion. They stuck there, and Israel was not able to kick them out. Right? And um, by the time it came to the middle of 49, Israel was getting ready to kick them out. And if you ask me a question, could they have done it? I think, yes, if the war would have continued, they would have kicked them out. But it wasn't a Dover push it. And the fact is that by the time they came to the negotiations in 49, middle of 49, um, each, uh, Syria was holding chunks of Israel, so to speak, of the Galilee. And uh, by that time, Truman got involved, the French got involved, and it messed everything up. They should have gotten out of the way and whatever, but that's not what happened. And the point I'm making is that when they finally made the armistice, it was very complicated. The Syrians said, yes, we will withdraw from Palestine because it's not part of Syria, um, but we want to have whole areas that are like buffer zones, demilitarized zones. There's Arabs living there. Israel can't touch them. And it's not Syria. It's not exactly Israel. It's sort of Israel, but it's an area that's on the Israel side, but Israel doesn't have the right to, to, to be in. So left in a whole big mess um, in the terms of the international jurisprudence, I guess. In uh, 51, 52, Ben-Gur in 53, Ben-Gur just invaded, you understand? Meaning the Jews just took over these areas on the DMZ on, on their side. That's this kind of stuff over, uh, yeah. You sort of see it, you know, in, the, in, in these, this is the other side, but uh, it, it's the previous map. They took over this stuff here, okay? Whether they were allowed to or not, they said we're doing it. And they, by the way, they kicked the Arabs who were living there out. Uh, this is what they called the Hula Swamp, what they, what they drained it and all that whole business and added territory. All this enraged the Syrians. Uh, but like I say before, the Syrians uh, said Israel should drop that and, but give us what we want anyway. So it's not exactly a uh, conducive style for successful negotiations. Uh, to make a long story short, there was a water enmity between Israel and Syria. Israel would not let Syria legally into the Canary to Syria's fury. Syria sought to retaliate by cutting off the rivers located in Syrian territory which provide water to the Canary. Can you follow that? The Canary itself is that big lake. There, it, it doesn't come from nowhere. There are rivers, little ones, the Yarmouk River and others, Hasmonic, that I think they call them headwaters. I don't know. They, 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 what do you call it? They feed into, you know, they provide the water into the lake. That's in Syria. Okay? So uh, the Syrians said like this, you want less than the Canaret? We cut off the water. Israel said, you can't cut off the water because since we have the Canaret, that implies the right to get the water that feeds the Canaret. And we can do this. And Syria, no, you can't. You already see where the fight is going to go. Since each one thought they had a claim to all the waters, because Israel's claim was that we have the canal, we have the right at least to the waters of the little rivers feeding into there. Each one sought to prevent the other one from benefiting from the waters. So it's like Shnai Mokhs and Batalas, but there's no Yachloko. You understand? Each one said, Kula Shali, and uh, each one said, It's all mine, 
and, uh, and if not, I'll kill you. Now, welcome to the Middle East. Accordingly, the two countries were shooting at each other already in 49, right after the armistice was signed. Israel infuriated Syria, as I told you before, by making unilateral moves in the demilitarized zone in Ben-Gurion's time. Now, this was going to lead to some really serious problems. In 1953, Eisenhower, Kidarko, said like this, let's settle this on a logical, scientific basis that everybody should benefit. You understand? And he appointed Eric Johnson, who was a lead, he was the head of the Chamber of Commerce when the Republicans were in power. Uh, Roosevelt sent Eric Johnson to negotiate with Stalin, so he wasn't a dummy. Okay? He's a very big businessman with a lot of international experience. He's, and jo- Eisenhower, in the typical American way, said, listen, we have a problem here over water. Figure out a fair way, right, to Yachloku. Everybody should get their half of the talus. You know, everybody should get their, their portion of water. Instead of everybody shooting each other, come up with something that's genuinely fair, doesn't favor one side over the other, and everybody will be happy. Hopefully from this will come even a piece. Look, here's, here's Eric Johnson being interviewed. It's, it's, the, it's the realist but idealist. Typical American. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Eric Johnston, special emissary of the president to the Near East. Mr. Johnston, you've done so much work of national importance in the last 10 years under three administrations, I guess. I probably covered more of your press conferences than almost anyone else. Now you've just returned from the Middle East where you were the special emissary of the president. Can you tell us exactly what your mission was there? Yes, I went out to the Near East to present a program for the development of the Jordan Valley before the program was presented to the United Nations and perhaps summarily dismissed by the nations involved. The development of the Jordan Valley calls for the irrigation of 240,000 additional acres of land in this area, for the development of 65,000 additional horsepower of electric energy. Under this program, the four nations involved in which the Jordan, which comprises the Jordan watershed, would agree upon the division of the waters of the Jordan. It would avoid future conflict between the countries involved. It would make this valley blossom such as it has never done before and probably would allay a great many of the fears and the bitternesses that exist in this whole area. Well, Mr. Johnston, weren't your negotiations made considerably more difficult by the flare-up of trouble on the Israeli-Jordan frontier at about the time you were there? It certainly was made extremely difficult. As a matter of fact, the bitternesses and the hatreds are very difficult to describe here, and I think it would be difficult for us in America to understand them. Well, Mr. That, uh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, Mr. Johnson, do you think it's possible to put up a TVA authority uh, for the Jordan River Valley without peace in the Middle East? Oh, I certainly do. As a matter of fact, I think if the people involved would agree upon a division of the waters of the Jordan watershed, that that in itself would avoid future conflict and inside the riparian rights of the river. It will inevitably lead to future conflict, and the President of the United States wants to avoid that. Well, did you make progress? Yes, I went out there merely to ask these nations to consider the program and to talk to a special presidential envoy when he returned. In each instance, the heads of the governments of the countries involved agreed to study the program to see if it fitted into their particular plans and schemes and to talk to a presidential envoy when he returns and the president's asked me to return. You're going to be that presidential envoy. I think I am. Mr. Johnson, do you think that the Middle East can ever be turned back into that biblical land of milk and honey under such an electric project? Yes, it really can. There's, really, there's more and it's, more, it's very interesting, I think. But I think my point is like this. He's a very smart guy. Would you agree with that? He's an intelligent person. And uh, he worked up a plan and, uh, to divide the waters, even Stephen, in, I mean, uh, proportionately. And he said to the Arabs, they said this, hand it over to your own scientists and they'll agree, no, to see if I'm doing anything wrong. Right? I, I want to do this fair. Okay? And uh, he worked out a program of this. Jordan gets 45, Israel gets 40, and Lebanon and Syria combined get 15. It was a very fair program, and even the Arab experts agreed. You know, some of the, the Egyptians, they all agreed. But the governments won't sign anything with Israel, but they informally agreed to the Johnson quotas, and they've kept it till today. Ben-Gurion initially refused. Ben-Gurion at that time was very petulant. You know, he said like this, Israel could take all the water, uh, but Eisenhower, Kedarko, very quietly said like this, you take all the water, I give you new money. <laughs> that's it. And so Ben-Gurion backed off, and that's where things stood in the 1950s. Now, for its part, Israel was anxious to utilize its assigned water, because this is about 
um, to provide the country of Israel with water. Starting in 5356, they started what they called the National Water Carrier, which is Israel's main project till today. This is what provides the water. It's not the only thing provides the water. One of the main things provides the water to the country. It takes the water from Kinneret and brings it down to Tel Aviv, to Ashkelon, to the, to, the, to the Negev. It's a major source of the water. Originally, only a small part of it was supposed to be used for drinking water and most of it for uh, agriculture, but Israel's population has grown, Jews and Arabs, and today most of it is used for drinking water. You can look it up yourself if you want. In addition, excuse me, in addition to this, Israel uses desalination plants you know, to get the water from there. And even that's not enough water, and if you're astute enough as... Many of you are, you may remember a couple of years ago, somebody in Israel came up with a genius plan. They were going to import water from Turkey. <laughs> now, um, anyhow, by 1963-64, this whole water system that you see on the map was complete. This is exactly the time when Nasser's United Arab Republic, remember he teamed up to make one country with Syria, and then the Syrians broke away, and a series of Syrian governments came to power of unprecedented ideological radicalism. Uh, this is who they were. They, you know, kill Israel, kill Israel, kill Israel. Part of their radicalism was an act of anti-Israelism. And so they said, we've got to do something active against Israel. Until now, Syria was just, like I say, just a cancer in remission. Now it's uh, you know, become, become very active. Syria then said, in 63 and 64, when they're feeling their oats, if you don't acknowledge our access to the Kinneret, we're going to cut off these rivers and your water carry won't work. Israel said, you try that, we'll stop you. Syria said, we're going to try it. And actually, the new Israeli chief of general staff, the commander in chief of the army, Isaac Rabin, was, if you know who he was, he, was, he wanted a war with Syria. He's actually the guy that, 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 that kind of brought on the, the Six Day War, if you want to be honest about it. Um, and now the Arab League meets in the middle of 64, and they put out a message in which they say pretty clearly establishment of Israel is the basic threat the Arab nation agreed to forestall. And since it Israel is a danger, threatens the Arab nation. The diversion of the Jordan waters multiplies the danger of Arab existence, uh, even though Israel was only taking the water that was allowed to it. Remember what I'm saying. This was under the Johnson plan. Okay? Um, accordingly, the Arab states have to prepare the plans necessary for digging political, economic, social aspects. So if the necessary results are not achieved, collective military preparations, when they're not completed, will constitute the ultimate practical means for the final liquidation of of Israel. Um, you know what that means. So they're using, the, so let's put it this way. Yitzhak Rabin said, yes, you want to come and get it, we'll get, take you. And the Arabs are using toxic rhetoric that will wipe you out, will kill you all. And this is what the water led to over here. And there was no Eisenhower in charge at that time, it was Johnson. And as I told you before, he didn't have much traction in the Arab world. And so the thing really got out of hand. Um, Israel went ahead to implement the water carrier. They said, we're doing it. And they did it. The Syrians began diverting the headwaters. Israel bombed and wrecked the Syrian diversion equipment. That's what happened. They sent in the army, and they, especially the Air Force, and they destroyed the Syrian equipment that was left there, and the Syrians didn't pick it up over there. Syria now seems weak. Okay? Rabin actually bo that was stupid, he boasted, look how strong we are. All the Arabs, especially Syria, said, it's Nasser, you wimp. You understand? Nasser is not ready for war. You say you're the head of the thing. So in order to stick it to Israel without actually going to war, Nasser, in 1964, created something called the PLO. And that's how it started. Okay? It's part of the stupid tactics back and forth between the nations as, as, as a substitute for, for military action in May of 64. Whatever Nasser's tactical reasons were, no matter whether he thought it a malleable tool of his policies, Nasser had created something vital and he had unleashed powerful latent forces. This is how it happened. A month later, the Palestinians formed a Palestine National Council, which met in East Jerusalem. So remember, at that time, Jews couldn't go to East Jerusalem. It was an Arab city. And so even though it was part of Jordan, they all got together and formed the International Palestinian Cause, and they pledged, we shall return. And they, like General MacArthur, and they appointed this guy, Ahmed Shukari, who was a, diplom a Palestinian diplomat, to be uh, the head of the PLO, or, P P P P or the Palestinian National Council. Now, for the first time, unfortunately, after 16 years, they have a face. They have an identity. Okay? This was bad news for Israel, as you know. This was a disaster for Israel, although the effects would not be felt immediately. The reason I say it's a disaster for Israel is Palestinians have now formed a Zionist movement of their own. 
Okay, that, that's what happened, for better or worse. And even though I won't compare him with him, but it doesn't matter. A movement itself has its own reality. And you create a movement that has uh, infrastructure and uh, followers and uh, the international attraction of one kind or another. And now they have a voice, you see? Um, it revived the Palestine question, which, as I'm trying to show you, had been dormant. And it was the end of the honeymoon period uh, for Israel. Uh, you know, the good times, so to speak, were over. And just at the worst time, because Ben-Gurion had fallen from power, Eshkol was in charge, and Eshkol was no good. Now it's uh, popular to praise him, and uh, Tom Segan and all these books, they like to do that, I know, but uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Eshkol had his pluses, had his minuses, international relationships, and vis- vision was not his plus. You see? He didn't understand. He knew how to make a national quarter carrier. He knew how to give an effective response to, to, to an Arab argument on a campus where was a BDS rally. You see, that's not what Eshkol was. Now, on the other hand, in 1964, there was an Arab Palestine, only it was occupied by Jordan and Egypt. You get it? Does that, that kind of muddied the waters, the clarity of the message. Here these people are proclaiming to the world, we want a Palestinian state. Where? <laughs> Where? The West Bank, you got it. So you want to kick Jordan out? So kick Jordan out. You want to set up in Gaza? So set it up. If the whole point is to wipe out Israel... Not going to get much traction. Of course, it'll get traction among the Arabs, but they had that anyway. How are you going to get the world to buy into what I just described? You understand this muddy declarity of the message. Nevertheless, it was only a matter of time before the cause of the Palestinians would spread throughout the Second World and the Third World with their influence in the United Nations. It is what it is, and pretty soon, as we all know, Arafat will be with Castro and all these other leaders all over the world. They did uh, take this uh, cause in there. In 1964 to 66, the years we're dealing with, um, it spread to the communist world. And so it meant that the new PLO, which didn't exist a short time before, got traction in two worlds, the Arab world and the communist world. That's a lot of countries, I'm sorry to say. Okay? And so all of a sudden you see China and Russia and all, everybody's uh, you know, recognized them or semi-recognized them and helping them and si- saying we're on your side. So it's not like there's some, like the case had been before where nobody heard of them. Virginia Gildersleeve, heard of them, you know? Nobody heard of them. They didn't, didn't, didn't get any message out there. Now the opposite is happening. They're picking up huge traction, and it's Israel that's getting zero traction in these areas. Okay? Um, so it was a real problem. In addition to the evolved, like a perfect storm, another dimension of this Palestinian Arab phenomenon was occurring during the same period. Okay? Certain groups where, uh, that's Arafat, by the way. So he says, there's certain groups. That when he was young. Uh, like the PLO, listen closely to what I'm about to say. Uh, the, the, the groups like the Palestinian Liberation Organization were committed to a political struggle. Political struggle, that's bad enough. These other groups that I'm about to talk about were committed to a violent struggle, which is a little bit different. Okay? Um, think in the 1950s and early 60s of Arab students, Palestinian by background, who got jobs after they graduate from college in places like Kuwait or these other Gulf countries where they're loaded, you know, and they bring in these people to, to do engineering projects and stuff like that. Uh, you know, the Saudis and the other Gulf states don't like for money. And these guys uh, are employed, perhaps they're underemployed, and in the evening they get together and they start talking about how can we set up uh, something to get our land back. And they're young and they're talking about fighting with a gun. And because their thesis is politics won't work with Israel. The only thing that will work with Israel is to militarily attack them and hit them so hard again and again and again and again and again until they fall. Very Arab. You understand, throughout history, the Muslims fight by cutting and slashing. For example, the ISIS hopes if they do another 10 or 20 of these things in Paris, France will collapse. You understand? Maybe they're right. I don't know. But if they do another 5 or 10 or 20 9-11s, America will collapse. That's how they see it. And so they thought, we'll do a bunch of these things in Israel, Israel will collapse. You see? And the key element is you have to fight them. And you have to start now. The sooner the better. We've already lost 15, 16 years. Okay? That's a lost time. Now let's start right today or tomorrow, and we have to start killing them. You have to make raids, guerrilla tactics, whatever it takes. This was the, what these guys were talking about among themselves. Uh, George Habash, the, the, who was a medical student from Lebanon, he's already you know, making these things in the 50s. Um, what kind of violent struggle was open to these people? Uh, not a conventional war. Israel has a tzahal uh, with tanks and planes and all that stuff, an organized army. 
These guys know they don't have anything like they can't beat them in a in a conventional war. But it's the sixties, my friends, and it's the age of guerrilla war. It's the age of Algeria, Mao Zedong, the Viet Cong, Che Guevara, the glorification of the armed struggle, the People's War, the wars of national liberation. Am I ringing bells in anybody? We all remember these cliches from yesterday, um, and the other cliches. These were the big names, you know, over there, and the youth on the campuses were. Uh, enraptured around the world, romanticized these people. It's always Givaldic, and you can always... And by the way, the reason is because they won. You know, state, a lot of these uh, struggles won. Uh, in China, and in, in Vietnam, and in, uh, in Africa, and places, it, it did work. And so this became sexy. That's the only word I can use. That, and, and this, it, it, it grabbed the imagination of everybody, and the result is Arafat, these other guys coming up, they said, this is what we're going to do. Okay? We're going to have an armed struggle... A war of National Liberation, a guerrilla campaign against Israel. And so they formed groups like Al Fatah and the Pal- Popular Front, Liberation of Palestine, and a whole bunch of other groups to recruit Arab fighters, no, to get young people to physically attack Israel. This did not exist before the time I'm talking about. Okay? Uh, the goal is to destroy the state of Israel. And starting in 1965, I might say on, on New Year's, Israel starts to get hit with a wave of all these attacks. And Israel is tremendously vulnerable. We're vulnerable today. But at that time, the West Bank was Jordan. And so, you know, people talk about going back to the old borders, forget that uh, they killed a girl in, in Baifagan, uh, coming in from the other side. They blew up something in uh, Talp- uh, what did it, with Talpia, you know, all kind of neighborhoods in Yerushalayim, as well as in the Tel Aviv area, because you can't stop them. They didn't have a wall at that time like they got now. And so they used to come in from Jordan, all these places, and blow this up and kill this person. They, they, at that time, they blew up a school bus in '65 with kids in it. Just it's forgotten today. You understand? So, in other words, they have the ability to hurt. It's like the stabbing attacks that are going on now in the Intifada. It, it may not throw over Israel, but they have the ability to hurt. And uh, this is what they did. The problem is, of course, that this Che Guevara model, the Algeria model, doesn't actually fit. It was a, it was a bad analysis. You cannot destroy Israel with Fedayeen raids although you can freak them out. This is what the fundamental flaw has remained till today. You cannot militarily defeat a country like Israel with guerrilla raids. There's any more than you could defeat a country like America with guerrilla raids. And the reason I say that is because you can form, you can compel countries to leave this area and go home, but Israel's, the Jews are home. So there's nowhere for them to go. You follow? They could get the British to leave uh, Egypt or Ireland because they go back to England. They go back to the French to get out of Algeria or Morocco because they go back to France. Where are the Jews supposed to go? But the racism that is at the very core of the Palestinian national um, culture, I'll say it again, the racism was at the core of it, and the extreme contempt they have for the Jews, which is profoundly racist, although nobody will acknowledge that, uh, caused this bad analysis. The Jews aren't really there. They're colonialists. They'll go back to Poland. They'll go back to Germany and places like that because that's, that's, that's where they really feel comfortable, and this whole thing is a colonial enterprise. So in other words... Logic, as is always the case with every country, every culture, including our own, it, logic is always blurred by culture. You understand? You have your cultural presumptions, and you operate within that little universe, and that's what they did in, in this kind of case. The theories, I say, come from colonial situations like Algeria, Vietnam. The Fatah and the PLO were committed because of their cultural arrogance, I just said before, which is dismissive of any Jewish legitimacy whatsoever. I don't have to say this to this audience. Did the United Nations say yesterday the Kever Rochel is now really the Kever Fatim or something like that? You know, so uh, no, I'm serious. So their idea is the, the jargon at that time: Israel is a colonial power. It's oppressing the masses of the masses. They love that word. The masses of the Arabs living inside the state of Israel, but these masses can be armed and led to their liberation by vanguard guerrilla groups. That's all the sprach, all the language at that time. But the reality is much more different. There was a small Arab minority in Israel. It was 150, 200,000 Arabs and 2 million Jews. That's not exactly what you call a Viet Cong situation. You understand? Usually it's the other way around. The 2 million are the ones you're trying to liberate and the 100,000 are the ones that are pressing them, not the other way around. You follow? As a result, you and I know that groups like Fatah and company will wage a guerrilla war against Israel for the next 30 years that will be quite unsuccessful in attaining its goals. I'll say it again. Quite unsuccessful in attaining its goals. They will not militarily weaken Israel. They will not really prevent, present a genuine threat to Israeli national security. They cause a lot of grief, that's all. The violent, constant attacks will propel the Palestinian issue to the forefront of world attention and sympathy, 
what remains today, that's an interesting lesson. In other words, the anti-Semitism that, that they le- will touch a button with the world, and so when they kill Jews, it's just a, a sad fact, and Europe and the others, they'll say, good. They don't like what happens to them, but what happens to the others is okay. But it will muddy the Palestinian cause, making it seem cruel and bloody, and therefore undeserving of support. Meaning that all the presidents, uh, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, uh, Carter, Reagan, and Bush, will refuse to talk to the PLO, if you recall this policy, because they're embracing this policy of killing of kids and things like the, the, the terrorism. Okay? And this was Israel's ace in the hole in the 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. The United States would not uh, discuss with them anything until it got to the point that Arafat even said, of course he's lying, he said, all right, we, we give up terrorism, we give up violence, we're only going to political routes. Uh, we all know that's worth But w- once he said those words, America spoke to him. A few years later, he got the, the Oslo conference. So I'm trying to show you how these things uh, operate over here. So Israel will find itself now, after 64, subject to constant active assault politically by the, uh, the Palestinians. Before that, they were only uh, uh, subject to Arab hostility, which didn't have any practical consequences. Look, here's King Saud of Syria. Oh, he cu- I'm, I'm, I'm Saudi Arabia. He cussed Israel out day and night. All the- and so, like what happened in the 50s as a result of the enmity of King Saud to Israel? Garnished. You understand? Uh, if it's Arafat, it's a different story. Things happen. They'll blow up a plane, they'll kill people, they'll make a raid, they'll do things, they'll assassinate, and all the rest of it. Now, um, let me point out a couple of facts that you and I are familiar with now, but probably don't take into perspective. It took the Zionist movement 50 years to get Israel. Agreed? So here's Abba Hill Silver in 47, 48. So, 47 is when they got the partition resolution. Herzl started in 1897. That's 50 years. So it took them 50 years to get uh, the world to grant the, Jew, the world to grant the Jews a, Palace, uh, a Jewish state. It took the Arabs 30 years. The PLO started in 64. By 93, which is 29 years later, um, they already got a partition state that's pretty quick. That's the Oslo Agreement, right? What was the Oslo Agreement? We're creating a Palestinian state. They will get it so quickly because the Jews, for better or worse, buy into the political arguments in favor of a Palestinian state. Most Jews, I wish I was wrong, most Jews, or many, many Jews, I didn't take a poll, say this, Palestinians are right too? Um, is it, did you have this thing? I'm looking, okay. Uh, uh, just the other night, just for the heck of it, I went on the internet and I found the conversation before I show it to you. Um, one of these Jewish uh, programs. And here's Eric Yaffe. Do you know he's, he's the, he was, used to be the head of the uh, reform? Right? He just uh, uh, quit or something. He was the head of the reform. But he's passionate pro Israel. Here's a reform rabbi in America who goes on the campuses. I want to put this in perspective. Who goes on the campuses uh, a lot. And he makes the argument in favor of Israel and against the BDS. Okay? But he's an American Jew. And he's a passionate pro Israel. He's an American Jew. And so his idea is like this We have to do justice for the Palestinians too. I completely condemn, you'll see, he says, the terrorism, but we have to have a two state solution. Why do you have to have a two state solution? Because there's justice on their side as well. So the political argument, the PLO, not of the violent part, gets traction among American Jews and among Israeli Jews as well. Take a look at this. The other side to that, Steve, let's begin with the premise that we condemn Palestinian terrorism unequivocally. Unequivocally. Um, Yet it is often conservative voices who are unable to recognize that having done that, that there are some legitimate issues having to do with justice for the Palestinians and political arrangements and the need to take action that will resolve the political situation there, potentially involving a two-state solution. They're, they're unable to suggest that that's even a, a legitimate topic of discussion now. And the truth of the matter is that that needs to be on the table as well. It is possible to be unequivocal in your rejection and condemnation of Palestinian terrorism and still say we need to talk about a Palestinian state and the issues of justice for the Palestinian people. And that's a legitimate and, in fact, an important discussion that contributes to the overall... Now, this guy, I mean it when I say it. He's the best reformer. <coughs> no, I, I, I'm not being funny. And he's, he, as far as I'm aware, anyway... He's the best one out there and so forth. And he buys into the synagogue. So then the question becomes like this. How come they didn't get 
a full Palestinian state in Oslo in 93? The answer, of course, is the PLO doesn't really want to partition Palestinian state. Okay? Uh, ben Gurion did want to, but Ben Gurion would said, "I'm willing to take half." Arafat, we all know, never wanted half. It was a lie. He never wanted half. Even when he's offered a good deal, when Clinton at the Camp Day 2000, you remember this? When Barack, when Barack gave away the store, to so give the whole West Bank, and uh, you know, very little that he held back for Israel, or when he got even a better deal under Bush. At the Annapolis conference, uh, Abel Olmert said, we'll give you the coat I mean, that's the dirty truth. You understand? They said, can we have a function, remember, a functional arrangement of the land? Give him the coat So no, there's nothing that he didn't give back, but that's not what they want. <laughs> you see? So what I'm trying to say is like this. They could have gotten, like Herzl, in 30 years a state. It'd be a partition state. But that's not what they wanted. The Palestinian ideal, rather, is as we know, Gaza, a base, from which to wipe out Israel. They don't want a separate state living next to I don't need to tell you. State living next to Israel, they want a state from which they can attack Israel. That's the difference between Zionism on the one hand and the Palestinian national movement on the other hand. And, uh, you know, this guy, Eric Allen, he's got to know that because he's no dummy. But it's very hard for an American you know, to, to say those words because then you commit yourself to an eternal struggle. At the same time, the Fatah phenomenon, the al Fatah phenomenon, presented Israel was a challenge of asymmetrical warfare, which Israel has not had a good answer. Nobody's had a good answer. Okay? Ever since this popped up, Israel's had the problem of what you do in asymmetrical warfare. That means, I have a big army, Israel has an A-bomb. Israel has an H-bomb. So theoretically, if they go hit Israel, I can nuke them. You can't do that. That's a disproportional response, as the expression goes down. Well, what's a proportional response? You don't go, eh, you know, like this. And... No, no, no. It becomes a minuet of exquisite torture. Uh, how, do you, you know, how, how does one actually do this? Because uh, whatever you do is, comes, you know, is excessive. You see? Um, now, America has this problem. Every country in the world has this problem. It may be now because of ISIS that ideas may, may or may not change as far as Western proportional versus disproportionate responses. That's one of the challenges of the time we're living in, but who knows? But already at that time, in 1966, the Al-Fatah raids freaked out Rabin and Eshkol, there wasn't been going in there, and Israel responded with a disastrous raid on El Samu in 1966. Okay? Here's Hebron, as you can see. This is the old border. This is Israel. This is Jordan. Okay? The West Bank. Here's Hebron, and here's a little town near there called El Samoa. Okay? And what happened was, I'll just read you very briefly over here. In November 3rd of 66, it's not long before the Six-Day War, um, a landmine blows up an Israeli car, police car, carrying, killing three Israeli policemen on the West Bank border. Since 65, since 1965, King Hussein had been trying to prevent these. Because he didn't want Israeli retaliation. And, you know, his, his goal is to hold on to his rule of the West Bank. Um, so he doesn't love Israel. But it's King Hussein apologizes to Israel over this, but the American ambassador, who was a friend of Israel, Walter Barbie, I'm saying he was a friend of Israel, he, he flubbed and delivered a message. He didn't deliver it. There's different reasons why they say it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, now, wait a second, hold on. Uh, King Hussein, as they say, apologized. For three years, Hussein had been meeting clandestinely with uh, Golda Meir and Abba Iban about mutually secure borders. But nevertheless, the whole thing blew up in this way, and uh, Israel uh, said, I guess, we've got to hit them back hard. And so they send in a raid, in which basically, they go to this town, they tell them to get out of the house, they put everybody in the square, and they blow up all the houses in the town. Uh, all the houses in the town. Meanwhile, unexpectedly, the Jordanian army shows up, which they weren't, wasn't part of the scenario, got into a big battle, Israel had to bring in the Air Force, the bomb the Jordanians, a bunch of them got killed, and the whole thing turned into a mess. And then they withdrew. So the point is, if this was 1953 and 1963, it would have been Gurion in the early days of the state, and not Eshkol in 1966, maybe they could get away with it. You know, we talked about it in the past. Even then it wasn't Prussian. But Gurion was expected to get away with it. Never going to happen in 66. Even LBJ was outraged, and he's the best friend of Israel. He said, what is Israel trying to do? Overthrow King Hussein? In other words, what do you gain by weakening Jordan? 
All that does is make a king look like a wimp. They'll get rid of him. You'll be in a better situation. So Johnson says, like, look, I'm on your side, but I don't understand what you're operating. And the truth of the matter is, Johnson was right. It was a dumb move on the part of Israel. Walt Rothschild was the national security advisor, the Jewish guy. He was the national security advisor under Johnson. Or, or Walt, Walt was in Rothschild. And he wrote a whole memo. Look at this. I'm not suggesting our usual admonition against retaliation, saying that posture. Retaliation not the point. The 3,000 man raid with tanks and planes was all out of proportion provocation and was aimed at the wrong target. And they didn't notice if you want to hit Syria, that's where it is starting. Yeah? And hitting Jordan so hard, the Israelis done a great damage to our interests and to their own. They wrecked a good system of tacit cooperation between Hussein and the Israelis. Johnson and uh, Walt Rostow know that really, underneath the table, King Hussein is cooperating and talking with the Israelis at that time. Uh, they've undercut Hussein. We spent a half a billion to shore him up as a stabilizing factor, but it is the longest border between Syria and Iraq, and Israel's attack increases the pressure on them to counterattack, not only from the radical governments and the Palestinians in Jordan, but from the army, meaning the Jordanian army, which is his main source of support, and they now press for a chance to recoup its losses. They set back uh, progress towards long-term accommodation in Israel. They may have persuaded the Syrians that Israel didn't dare attack Soviet protected Syria, but could attack the U.S. back Jordan with impunity, which is true. It's important that we strengthen the hands of those with the Israel government to feel it's not the proper way to handle the problem. Even the Israeli military now doubt that this will stop. In other words, it's the old question of disproportionate response. And you're hitting the wrong time, the wrong place. And when I say disproportionate response, I mean over here like this. Did you hurt yourself? Did you shoot yourself in the foot in doing this? Right? I'm not talking about the morality of it. That's a separate way. Did you do the right thing in all this? So basically, welcome to, you know, uh, who is, let, let me put it this way, who is the big winner of the Al Samu rig? It wasn't Israel. It wasn't Hussein. Here is the winner. Uh, yeah. Well, it's Arafat. Okay? Yeah. He was the winner of the Al Samu rig. Correct? So that's the last thing Israel wanted to do. So you got a bad policy if as a result of your military action hurt your your national interests. You understand? And so I'm trying to show you that Israel was in a bad place over here. Um, what can I say? Welcome to the world of asymmetrical uh, warfare. Uh, you and I are familiar with this from the recent Gaza war. Take a look at this. Now, you know the point. You watch it on CNN and one of these things around the world. Oh, cruel Israel. What about the fact that they shot a rocket at Israel? Well, it's an episode <laughs> Now, what I'm trying to say is like this. So Israel, and by the way, Israel in the last war did their best to try to fight the PR war. They're a lot more sophisticated than they've been in the past. They did it with Ron Dermer and all that stuff. They tried their best. But it's real hard because nobody has a good political solution for asymmetrical warfare. You get what I'm saying? It's, it, it, it doesn't work. And so, and by the way, Eshkol lost this. Ben Gurion, of course, said like this. This proves what I've been saying all along, which is Eshkol's a bumbler. You know, they never should have. What are you saying for? We should be hitting Syria, if anything at all, or figuring out some other way. Um, all I can tell you is that this raid, and, I'll, and Johnson was the president, even the best president for Israel. This raid showed that the honeymoon was over, and the snake is now in the Garden of Eden, where unfortunately it has been. Ever since then, uh, we are done. Good night. Next lecture in two weeks, I remind you. Not next week, two weeks. Good night.